ask you to turn with me this morning to the Gospel according to John, to very familiar verses. We'll just read part of this chapter again from verse 24. The disciples had met together on that first Lord's Day following the crucifixion of the Saviour. But we read in verse 24, But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. Thomas is a well-known character to us, and although he appears from time to time in the Gospel accounts, this particular occasion is the event by which we know him the best and of which we most think, no doubt. Thomas has frequently been described, and with good reason, as the world's greatest doubter, or the world's greatest sceptic. And his doubts and his conversion, as it were, are recorded in Scripture for us for very good reason. Of course they are, because of course everything that's recorded in the Scripture is there for a good reason. God has given it to us that we might learn from these things. But supposing there was someone who had serious doubts about the truth of the Word of God, someone who had lingering doubts about the truthfulness of the Gospel account of the, res of the crucifixion of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, and of all the ramifications of those two momentous events. Supposing there was such a person, and supposing that person was open to be convinced, and in order to be convinced, he would look around for someone who was like him, someone who also doubted, or even someone who had worse doubts, more, more profound doubts than he had. And he said to this other person, well, look, you go and you see what you make of it and then you come back and tell me what you find. Well, that's exactly what we've got here. We can, as it were, say to Thomas, well, you're like me, in fact, you're worse than me with your doubts. Come and tell me what you have found when you inquired about the truthfulness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what I'm trying to say is that if we've got doubts of any kind, we can look to Thomas and we can discover what happened to him and find out how even he was convinced. And then we will surely be left with no doubts whatsoever in our mind because his testimony, knowing how doubting he was, must be very persuasive and very powerful as, as we listen to what he would say to us. Well, supposing we looked around for someone to go and inquire of these things, someone who had doubts like us. Well, Thomas, well, you couldn't find anyone better than him. He's a fine candidate. And for three reasons, at least, he would not believe. He was absolutely persuaded in his mind that he would not believe until and unless he could see the imprints of, of the nails in the hands and the feet of Jesus and, and touch these things and place his hand into the side where the spear went. Unless he saw these things, he was absolutely resolute, I'm not going to believe. That's what he says. Well, here's a doubter, in spite of the fact 
of everything that he had known and seen. This is what makes him such a credible witness. He had, first of all, three years of first-hand experience of the Lord Jesus. He had such experience of Christ as surely a man like that would believe anything that the Saviour promised and said and did. Nothing miraculous would surely be ever anything of a surprise to a man who had for three years, first of all, seen the character of Christ so close up, seen how pure he was, this unworldly holiness that belonged to him, convincing indeed that he was not just a man, but more than a man, he was the Son of God in the flesh. Seeing all of his sincerity and of his kindness, all of that close up, the wonderful, unique character of Jesus. Thomas had seen it all. And the words of Christ, his unique wisdom and his profound insights into the things of God and into human life and the condition and his convincing authority and the power of his works over sickness and disease. Thomas had seen it all. He'd even seen the Lord Jesus raised from the dead and the power of Christ over the elements, stilling the storm and all of these things and even power over devils. Now Thomas had seen all of that. Now if he'd seen all of that and still doubted the resurrection but then came to faith, well, surely that makes him a very credible witness for anybody else that's got doubts and reservations. Another reason for him being such a fine candidate is that he knew exactly what to expect. First of all, in the death of Christ and in the resurrection of Christ. The Lord Jesus had made it abundantly plain to the, to the disciples in the course of his teaching. He was going to give himself into the hands of wicked men who were put him to death. Had that happened? Yes, it had happened. He warned about Peter denying him. Had that happened? Yes, that had happened. All of these things, all of the little minute details that are described for us concerning the, rest, the, the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ, it was all there, just as he'd been promised. And so when it comes to the third day, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Well, they knew what to expect. They all did. They wouldn't believe it to begin with, and Thomas wouldn't believe it even when he was told about it by those who had doubted it themselves. But they knew exactly what to expect. Why should they be surprised? But Thomas certainly was. What a doubter he was. And then, of course, thirdly, there was the personal testimony of his own trusted friends. They had all seen him, ten of them. Ten had seen him alive. Why wouldn't he believe them? He'd been with them together as disciples for those three years. They must have known each other pretty well, wouldn't you think? They would have followed the Lord Jesus all around Judea and Galilee, and they'd have been together in all kinds of different circumstances and situations, all they've been through together, and yet when they tell him that he's alive, he wouldn't believe them. And they had no reason to deceive him. Why would they? What benefit was it? What advantage was it to them to set out to deceive them? And they had indeed personally seen the Lord Jesus. Verse 19. The same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. That's what they had described, you see. He'd appeared suddenly and unexpectedly whilst in a locked room. And bodily, he showed them his hands and his feet and his side and so on, and they'd seen all of this. And there was no doubt in their minds now that this was truly the Lord Jesus. This was not a figment of their imagination. This was not some phantom appearance. This was him, the self-same Jesus that had been crucified, risen from the dead. And of course, what they did was to take great pains to try and convince Thomas in verse 25. 
The other disciples therefore said unto him, now in the original language, that would say, the other disciples therefore were saying unto him. In other words, it's continuous. And the implication there is that they didn't just say it once, and now Thomas, you'll have to make up your mind about this. They kept on saying it. In other words, it suggests that they were trying to persuade him, that they kept on saying these things. They could see the doubt in his mind, but they wouldn't leave it there. They were intent on convincing Thomas of the truth of the matter. But he wouldn't have it. So if we think that we have doubts, and we're sceptical, and we lack confidence at times in different ways, well, you go to Thomas, and he was far worse than any one of us, and he was without excuse for it, but he still doubted, and there were still reservations in his mind. So his witness and his testimony must be worth listening to, having come to faith and being convinced and converted in the end. Now, his unbelief was a determined unbelief. He says there in verse 25, except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails. You see, he was saying, not just the sight, it might not be real, I might be imagining it. So when I see the print of the nails, I want to put my finger into the print of the nails to make sure that what I'm seeing with my eyes is the real thing. That seems to be the, the impression there. And thrust my hand into his side, except I shall see these things and do these things, I will not believe. He's quite resolute and determined about this. Now, this is most unreasonable, isn't it? His condition for faith, how unreasonable. When so much had already been shown to him. He'd heard so much of the testimony of these credible witnesses whose character they, he knew, but he says, well, I know all of that, but I want to know more. And you find people like that, don't you? Doesn't matter what you tell them or what answers you give to their questions, there's always something else. Ever notice that? You know, the many red herrings that people throw in the way of believing. And they've made up their mind, you see. I'm not going to believe. It was an unreasonable demand, having heard so much and seen so much, but it was also, as I say, so very willful. I will not. People have that willfulness, and you wonder whether anything will satisfy them in the end, whether any amount of evidence will be enough for people in that frame of mind. But will the Lord give them what they want? Jesus was very gracious to Thomas, very gracious to Thomas, but, but you see what happens at the end of the chapter here, what he would say to us, Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. This is not the first time in the scriptures that we find the Lord saying to us, you want me to show you this and you want me to give you an evidence for that and that and the other, but you've got my word, and that should be enough. That should be enough. To most people in the world, that's all we get, the word of God. And we're expected to believe the word of God. It is an impertinent thing, isn't it, to make demands upon God? Why should the God of heaven, the creator of heaven and earth, have to prove himself to us? Who do we think we are? to make demands upon him. It's rather that the Lord should say to us, who do you think you are in demanding from me such things as you demand? Why won't you believe me? Who do you think you are in making that stand in your own heart and in your own mind? A dreadful impertinence, and we have to be careful about these things. But also, what a great slight it was upon those who deserved his trust, first of all, his friends. What would you make of a friend who said, I don't believe you, I can't trust you? 
I've spent years with you, but I don't think I can believe what you're telling me. How would you feel if someone said that to you? And the Saviour, three years he'd spent with him, so honest and trustworthy, the one that came into this dark, ignorant, deceived world to bring truth and light. And yet here is Thomas tantamount to saying to everything that the Lord had promised him and predicted, don't believe it, don't believe it. What a slight to put on the Saviour. He didn't come to deceive, he didn't come to destroy, he came to tell the truth and to save. Or oh, we should certainly, most definitely, believe everything that he tells us in his word. All his promises are yea and amen. So what would Thomas say to us? All of this evidence, and still he wouldn't believe. Still he was determined not to believe. But what would he say to us now? His message to us now would surely be something like this. Listen to me, listen to me. If you doubt in any way whatsoever, so did I. But not anymore, not anymore. I was brought to the point where I realized that the Lord Jesus was indeed risen from the dead. This same one that I knew for through three years, he was crucified, but he was risen from the dead. And I saw him. And I knew that this was the one who had done exactly and everything that he had promised to do. He went to the cross for me, but he rose again on the third day and he's appeared to me. He is my Lord. He is my God. How can he be anything other or anything less than God in the flesh? Knowing everything. Knowing all I thought and all I said. You see, Thomas must have been convinced. Because there, suddenly he was met with the other ten disciples. And, it, and suddenly, through the locked door, somehow, we don't understand how, the Lord Jesus suddenly appears. And he, as it were, knows exactly everything that Thomas had thought and said those seven, eight days beforehand. This is omniscience. This is God present amongst those disciples. So here is a convinced Thomas, here is a persuaded Thomas, here is a converted Thomas who had more doubts than ever we probably will have had, more reason to believe and yet he squashed them all but even he was brought to faith and to repentance. So supposing we're not believers this morning. Supposing we're a bit sceptical about these things, about the personal claims of Christ, about his actual death, about his real resurrection, and not just the events, but the meaning of it, the purpose of it. Listen to what Thomas would tell us. Listen to his profession as he speaks to the Lord, my Lord and my God. More than that, listen to what Jesus would say to us. Peace, be not faithless, but believing. Is that just an encouragement, or is it more than an encouragement? Is it a command that comes from heaven? Don't entertain those doubts any longer, but believe in the Saviour. High time we did believe, if we've never believed before, in the Saviour and all his saving promises. Well, there might not be confirmed, hardened, unbelievers among us, but there might be waverers, those who have never really given ourselves up to the Lord as we know we ought to do, wavering on the brink as it were, trying to live halfway between the world and faith, one day believing, the next day not quite so sure, one day wanting to walk with the Lord in true Christian faith, the next day back there in the world wavering. Perhaps a kind of lack of confidence in the Lord in some way. If I do nail my colours to the mast, if I do make a true profession of faith, well, I'm not sure how things will work out and perhaps I'll be in trouble in one kind or another. Well, you know the promises of Christ, but you're wavering. Well, why won't you trust him? <laughs> 
Is he not trustworthy? Is he a deceiver? Is there nothing in the word of God? Is there nothing in his promises? Did he not really go to the cross? Did he not truly rise from the dead? Is his sacrifice really not enough for our sins? Are the promises concerning life, are they not valid? Is there a deceptiveness about these things? Well, this, none of this is true. He is worthy to be trusted. Don't waver. Be not faithless, but believing. Give yourself up to the Lord. And then what about doubting believers? And there are such experiences that we pass through. Doubts. Maybe even doubts about salvation at times. But doubts as we face a particular crisis of some kind and we doubt whether the Lord can see us through or we doubt whether the Saviour will be faithful through all of these things. Doubting, unconvinced about the faithfulness of God. Well, Thomas would have a word for us, wouldn't he? Don't be like that. Don't mistrust the Saviour. Look, he's risen from the dead. If he can conquer death, if he can come and appear to someone like me and overturn all my unbelief and remove all my doubts, well, he can do the same for you. He can uphold you and he can fulfill all his promises for you. Be not faithless, but believing. Perhaps we're troubled by a general lack of real trustfulness. And that's a great thing and a great aspect in the Christian life, isn't it? Lacking trustfulness. That when we pass through all the difficulties of life, never mind, the Lord is here. Can we really say that? Or are we troubled by things that go on? Never mind, the Lord is present. The Lord reigns. God has got all things in his hands to do. And more than that, he's got me in his hands. And so why should I fear? Can we speak in those terms or do we get plagued with doubts and fears and times of great anxiety? Well, be not faithless. Be believing. Trust in the Saviour. Listen to Thomas's testimony that would come through the pages of Scripture to us. Doubting believers. Oh, it can happen to us. Just lacking that confidence in the Saviour, in all that he is, all that he promises to do, his faithfulness day by day. Or may God dismiss the doubts from our minds and give, give us that confidence in him of which he's so worthy, so worthy. Anything less than utter confidence is really a slight upon his goodness and his faithfulness. And then what about backslidden Christians, backslidden believers? What's the message for such today. Backslidden. The reality of Christ and all that he did needs to be brought back to our minds and to our hearts if we're in that state. Maybe the world has come in, perhaps we become too concerned about the immediate, too concerned about the things we have to do, the duties we have to perform, the responsibilities we have, the pleasures that we can find in the world, perhaps all of that's come in and our spiritual life has suffered as a result of it. Perhaps we've fallen into sin of some kind and we're not right with the Lord and we, and we secretly and really know that that's the case. And we're just wondering now about where we stand and we're wondering about the forgiveness of God for these things. Well, be not faithless but believing, look at Thomas, do you doubt the grace of God? Do you doubt the forgiveness of God? Do you doubt that for you there can be forgiveness found and the salvation of God renewed to your soul, the joy of it, I mean? Well, look at the forgiving grace of Christ to doubting Thomas. We might call him a backslidden believer, mightn't we? For three years he'd seen so much, witnessed so much, promised so much, no doubt, and yet, in a way, just like Peter, who denied the Lord in that garden, now Thomas is even saying to his friends, I can't bring myself to believe. I'm not going to bring myself to believe. Not unless I see those wounds in his hands and put my fingers there and place my hand in his side. 
What a poor spiritual state that is. And yet what did the Lord do with him? How did the Lord treat him? So kind and so merciful and gracious. The Saviour returned that eight days later, the next Lord's Day, and Thomas was there. And what are the first words that Jesus utters in a situation like that? He says to the whole group of the disciples, Thomas included, at the end of verse 26, peace be unto you. Now, if we're in a poor state and we've allowed our spiritual lives to get in a low state, that might be the last thing that we would expect the Lord to say, peace unto you, because we don't feel much peace. We know we've let the Lord down. We know we've let the church down. We know that we've let our friends down. But what the Saviour would say, peace be unto you. Why? Because he's a forgiving God. Because he loves to restore his people. And he loves to have them back again. And the one thing he's determined and delights to, to know is his people walking again with him. Not to, to come with some hard rod, as it were. Well, perhaps we've already experienced the rod. But once we, we want to come back and turn to the Lord again, then there are those words, peace be unto you. Pronouncing peace, even with Thomas accommodating his demands on that occasion and showing his wounds. Perhaps that's what we need to see again if we're backslidden and we're in a low state. See again the wounds of Jesus in his hands, in his feet and in his side. What do those wounds mean? That he was crucified, that he went to the cross to bear our sins, even this sin, this sin of unbelief, the doubts that we entertain in our minds, the willfulness at times, the rebelliousness that we go through. Even those sins, those wounds speak peace, the wounds speak forgiveness, the wounds speak acceptance, the wounds speak of the grace and the love of Almighty God. Be not faithless. Look at the wounds again and see in the Lord Jesus a sufficiency, an absolute sufficiency to cover all our sin as we come in repentance and with faith. Well, there's another application of this that I would mention because there are numbers among us today that have concern for Thomases that we know. Thomases that, like Thomas, have spent years being taught the things of God. And yet, we can know their names and we can see their faces, perhaps, even as we sit here today. And there they are saying, I will not believe. Sometimes they make conditions. Sometimes they're just resolute in their unbelief. And it doesn't matter what will happen to them, so they think. Do you know a Thomas like that? Brought up in the fear of God, but out there in the world and saying, I will not believe. Well, look what happened with this Thomas. Gives us hope, doesn't it? Gives us encouragement as we pray for those doubting, willful Thomases out there in the world that even yet, they'll be brought back. They'll be brought to humility. They'll be brought to repentance. And the Saviour is there. And when the Saviour draws such, they'll come and they'll believe and they'll know that peace of God that we long to see them experiencing. And we go on with our prayers for such Thomases out there in the world even today. But then just look before we finish at what the Lord says to Thomas in verse 29. Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. And the implication there is that although Thomas has been brought to true faith, restored to true faith, we might say, by the sight, the physical sight of the Lord Jesus risen from the dead. And by that, of course, by his believing, he is wonderfully blessed. Of course he is. Because faith brings salvation. 
and a, and a sure knowledge of Christ brings a holiness of life and a glorious anticipation of heaven. Thomas was wonderfully blessed that day, knowing the forgiving grace of God. Yet the implication there is that there is a, a kind of a greater blessing for those who have not seen in a physical way like Thomas did, but yet have believed anyway. A kind of different level of blessing that comes upon such. Believing then on the strength of God's word alone, without preconditions and no demands for evidence, but coming to the word of God and saying, this is what God says, therefore I shall believe it, for I must believe it, it being the word of God. Now in what way is that an additional blessing, a higher blessing? Well, to begin with, you have the blessing of immediate salvation. Because that's the promise, isn't it? The sooner we believe, the sooner we know salvation. And we avoid, of course, in the process, all the danger of remaining in willful unbelief. The blessing of immediate salvation. I don't doubt that there will be thousands upon thousands of Christians in the world today who struggled and wriggled and, and for years wouldn't come. And then the Lord did bring them and they had to come and they did come. And all they would tell you now is, oh, that it had happened earlier. Oh, that I had been brought to faith sooner in my life. Partly because I wouldn't have made so many mistakes and blunders and I wouldn't today bear so many scars of that unbelieving life. But all the peace I forfeited, all the joy that I could have had earlier in life if only I'd come to believe in the Saviour. And you see, waiting, placing conditions about God, uh, upon the Lord, like Thomas was doing. Well, if he'd been there the week before, or if he believed immediately upon the testimony of his friends, he could have avoided all of those days of all that he went through. Now, my friends, what are you waiting for? If you've not believed yet, surely it's time to believe the word of God, to know the blessing of immediate salvation. And as I say, the blessing then of peace. The sooner we believe, the sooner the peace will be ours, the sure certainty of sins forgiven and a place in heaven with the Lord. It's a strange thing, isn't it, that in worldly terms, we want good things and we want them now. But when it comes to spiritual things, how we seem to be prone to put delays upon it. These things ought not to be. And then another advantage the greater blessing of believing without seeing is that it grants to us a stronger faith for the future. If you like, we have become accustomed to trusting the word of God alone. And when we face difficulties and problems in life, you know how it is, we want to see little signs, don't we, that God is here. And we want to see little evidences that things are working out, that, that things are in process, and often the Lord grants us such a privilege and such an encouragement. Oh, but how better off we are if we have learned just to take the word of God on its own strength. Just to be able to fall back upon the word of God, even if there aren't indications that the Lord is beginning to work. To be able to say to ourselves, I've got his word and that's enough. In fact, it's more than enough because it's his word. And the earlier that we learn such things, the better off we shall be. And then, of course, there's another blessing that becomes ours. The blessing of bringing honour to God by our believing of his word. Crediting him as being truthful and trustworthy, as he actually is. And that brings us to a stature in life, doesn't it? It raises us from the position of being doubters and sceptics and those that demand evidences of one kind or another 
No, we would say, I want to be someone who will bring honour to the Lord and I will just trust him and place the credit upon him for that which is really true of him. And then finally, there is the blessing of the honour that we shall find for ourselves. The blessing of the honour that we shall find for ourselves. When we're brought to faith, when we trust in the Saviour, we shall most certainly regret our earlier unbelief. And there'll be a, a sense of shame upon us that we could ever have gone through so many years, heard so many things, witnessed so many other testimonies of the Lord's people, and yet I wouldn't believe, oh, shame upon me. Shame upon me. Oh, but instead, as soon as the Lord speaks, I will, I will believe him, and that kind of brings an honour upon us, and particularly at the last day. You know, well done, thou good and faithful servant, and not least for being a people who take God at his word and believe what he says, simply because he says it. Because he says it. I trusted in the Saviour because of gospel promises. I lived the life I lived because it was the word of God and I trusted him for everything. Doubts, drive them away. Skepticism, have none of it. Faith, trust him. Fill your heart with faith. Believe in the Saviour and come to where Thomas finally stood and cry with him to the Lord Jesus, my Lord and my God.